the distribution of the stress amplitude experienced by all the points on the cross-section of the specimen. If we compare this effect between a pure stress gradient and the pure size effect, a famous paper in literature uh, by uh, Pogorecki and, and Karpenko, reanalyzed uh, more re recently by Papadopoulos, is that if you do a test in bending uh, with different size of the specimen, you can change the size with changing the, ratio, the radius, sorry, and in, the, in this case you change the gradient, or you can change the length of the specimen uh, with a constant gradient. So you can see on the left here that if you change the length with a constant stress gradient, the slope is very slow, around minus 0.2, whereas if you change the radius of the specimen, you, in this case you change the gradient, the slope is very more, much more significant. So in first approximation, many authors in literature consider that the pure stress gradient is more important than the pure size effect uh, if we do not talk about the effect of material defects, either in the volume or in the surface. Of course, on real components, there are many other effects that are mixed with the stress gradient and the size effect. The first one is uh, very well known. It's, this is a notch effect. Uh, you can see on the, the right side the different SN curve with different theoretical stress concentration factors. But there is also the effect of the material defects that are in competition at the surface between, uh, for instance, a pit on the slide that you can see, or a macroscopic notch. So there is a big question that is when a notch, uh, when the defects can be considered as a notch and vice versa. Usually, uh, an engineering approach considers that uh, the effect of defects can be predicted according to the Kitagawa Takashi diagram that is on the right, and for a critical size of the defects there is a big effect of big decrease on the fatigue strength. And there is also another scale with the stress and strain gradient, that is the scale of the microstructure. A lot of work has been initiated in this field, for instance in the US by McDowell and his team. Uh, you can see here an experimental illustration of the plastic strain and gradient in grains on a titanium alloy, and the simulation of that with a polycrystalline plasticity. And on the left, you can see uh, the equivalent things on a pure copper done by uh, some colleagues in France, Nicolas Sentier, Frank Morel, and others. So, in fact, all these effects are in competition. So, as a synthesis, we can, we can say that uh, the loading mode creates a stress gradient that will increase the high cycle fatigue strength. And on the opposite, the size effect will decrease the high cycle fatigue strength. So, these opposite effects are in competition. But the order of the results can be significantly modified because of notches and because of material defects, either in the core of the material or at the surface. So now I will shift to the second part of the presentation after this definition and the large introduction or context. I'm talking about the size effect assessment by probabilistic approaches. So first I show you uh, two examples of size effect and uh, the key role of defects in this size effect. So this is a, a first slide with, uh, at the moment, unpublished data uh, by Frank Morel obtained on uh, rolled metallic bonds used to produce the very long pipes for off offshore petroleum industry. And in these bonds, the crack appears at the surface, you can see here, on uh, metallurgical defects like the inclusion or on due to scratches or defects by the manufacturing process. And in this case, if you load the specimens with different loaded volume, very different loaded volume by, diff by very different lengths of the specimen, smooth specimens without any notch, uh, you can see on the left the, the, the SN curve under tension loading with R equals 0.1. In blue, you can see specimen with a loaded volume around 1,800 cubic millimeter, and in red, a volume that is a little bit around 10 times greater. And you can see there is a very strong effect of the loaded volume on the fatigue strength at 10 to the 7. And this is the same case if you increase the load ratio with the load ratio in the middle picture here with a load ratio of R equals 0.3. So here this is clearly an effect of the size effect due to the defects population. 
But the effect of the defects play also a very important role on the scatter of the fatigue strands. Uh, on the SN curve here on the right of the slides, you can see an SN curve on a spheroidal graphic cast iron with, a, a, with a shrinkage defects that, are, that is illustrated here. And you can see if you plot the probability distribution of failure versus the stress amplitude that there is a very big dispersion, very big scatter between around uh, 200 and 300 megapascal. So this is enormous. And you can see also that this probability of failure is following the Webull distribution. So in fact, in literature, most of the high cycle fatigue strength approach able to predict the size effect are based on the Webull approach. And the key assumption is the weakest link concept. So this is concept that has been proposed uh, in order to, pre to, to assess the, the failure of brittle materials. And the authors consider that in high cycle fatigue, the process is a quasi-brittle, equivalent to a quasi-brittle process. And the main assumption is that the material is seen as a series of uh, links, and the weakest link controls the failure of the whole structure. So in fact, the links are considered as the grains, and the smallest, the less resistant grain is controlling the failure of all the system. And the failure probability is uh, given by the famous equation that is here on the top, that is the distribution of failure with following the Webull distribution. And the Webull distribution has two variants, either a, a, a simple two-parameter distribution without any threshold, or a distribution with a three parameters and a threshold. And this threshold can be identified for different, uh, with different experiments. You can see on the table, on the bottom right of the slide, two different applications on a steel C35 and on the nodular cast iron. And what is important to note is that the, the controlling parameter of the scatter or the shape parameter is the M exponent. And depending on the value of the M exponent, if M is small, the scatter is large. If M is very important, it's higher, the scatter of the distribution is uh, smaller. So this type of approach can be used with whatever criterion you want. For instance, uh, Crossland, Papadopoulos, whatever you want. You compute an equivalent stress amplitude, uh, and you, you can describe that with the following uh, probability distribution in order to predict the scatter and the mean value of the fatigue strands. Another important thing is that uh, the size effect is intrinsic in the equation of Webull, I mean in the distribution of Webull. If you look in this equation, there is a mean value over a volume and over the loaded volume of the, the components. And this leads to the, this equation if you compare, for instance, two structures with the same shape but different volume. I mean only an homothesis between the two. You have a volume V1 and its fatigue strength, for instance here under Fourier reverse uh, loading, S, S1 exponent m, and this is linked to the second uh, geometry with volume v2 and its fatigue strength s2. And with this equation, you are able to explain and to predict the evolution of the fatigue limit, for instance, on these two steels here, under rotating bending, depending on the radius of the specimen. Of course, in this case, there are two different effects that are mixed, because this is a rotating bending test, we are mixing the stress gradient effect and the pure size effect. So several authors use this same approach with different equivalent stress or energy-based approach and can predict the, the results more or less in a good way. So what we can say as a synthesis is that the data scatter or the scatter of the fatigue strands and the size effect of the fatigue strands can be well predicted by such approach and which consider in a non-direct non way the microstructural heterogeneity and the defects in the material. And so this concept as weakest link is able to predict the fatigue data, the type of gradient effect, I mean the gradient effect due to the loading and the pure size effect. But this is a macroscopic view of the problem because we are considering here only the continuum approach and only the macroscopic stress strain in the different equation and the different uh, criteria that you can use with this type of uh, uh, probabilistic distribution. Now, if we look at the non-local deterministic approach, 
that are used to predict the stress gradient effect. So probably many of you or all of you know that if you apply uh, a local approach in high cycle fatigue, I mean whatever you, you want as criterion, I illustrate here on the left, sorry, the downward criterion and on the right the crossland criterion. On the left, if you apply that on different uh, specimen with notches, with stress concentration varying from 1 to 3.3, you can see that there is a big scatter of the data, no, not unique stress solved, so it means that uh, this approach is not able to predict the stress concentration effect. On the right, if you look at not the notch but defects, data from literature by the team of uh, Nado and co-workers like Biodo and others, you can see for different types of surface defects, like ellipsoid, like hemispherical defects with different size, if the size of the defect increases, the threshold for a given life, for instance 10 to the 7, decreases significantly. You can see that the decrease is very strong, depending, for instance, of a sphere of around 200 micrometer to 900 micrometer. So that's why in literature there are several and a lot of papers about non-local approach to predict that. So I propose to group or to categorize this approach in two main groups that are the groups computing mean values. I will pro present that in different dimensions, zero to three dimensions, and methods based on a stress gradient approach. So the first approach, computing mean values, are more or less approaching the, the, the question with the same way except the first one. So the first type of approach that I call the zero-dimensional method, that are the point method or the critical distance method, is based on the fact that if you imagine, a, for instance, a plate specimen under tension with a notch, uh, if you plot the elastic stress, assuming there is no plasticity, uh, you can try to predict the crack initiation by computing the criterion, not at the notch root, but behind the notch or deeper in the material at a critical distance. And theoretically, this distance should be related to a typical dimension of the microstructure. And the other approach, do not do that at a local point behind the notch root, but compute a mean value. And there are different approaches, either over a line, an area, or a volume. And different definition of this uh, distance, area, or volume. So first, about the point method of the critical distance, that are, this is the oldest approach. The first I know has been proposed by Neuber in the middle of the last century and many other evolutions. So the idea is to apply a multi-axial high cycle fatigue strength criterion at a critical distance, as I explained, uh, inside the material. So I illustrate here the approach proposed by Flaveno and co-workers that is named the critical distance with the Tangvan criterion that is a combination of the hydrostatic stress and the shear stress amplitude but you can use with whatever criterion you want the Crossland, the Matake, the Fatemis aussi, Finlay and, and so on and the idea with that is more or less since if we are unable to compute exactly the elastoplastic stress rate field as a notch we can try to predict without that with the elastic uh, stress distribution at a distance that is characteristic of the microstructure. And with this approach, you can see that the previous data I show you on the previous slides with a different uh, notch specimen can be unified here with a critical distance, for instance, of uh, 50, 50 micrometers. And this, uh, this type of approach give good results more or less. Of course, you need experimental data to identify this distance. And I show you some examples here of critical distance for different materials. Uh, theoretically, I mean theoretically, when you read the papers in literature, many authors write that this is correlated to the grain size. But in fact, it's not so very clear because, for instance, if you look at the titanium alloy in my slides, uh, in, many, in this type of titanium alloy, many authors explain that the critical dimension is the alpha platelet width, which is very smaller than the 120 micrometer, but probably around 10 micrometer or 8 micrometers. So it's not so clear to correlate that. Nevertheless, such approach gives good assessment to take into account the gradient effect for engineering application. But the lot type effect, I mean the pure stress gradient effect, is not considered neither the size effect. 
If we look at the methods computing a mean value either over a line or over an area, so the principle is not to compute at a critical distance, but to compute the mean value over a line from the notch root here in green. You compute an equivalent stress depending on the criterion that you want to apply. And in two dimensions, you compute over an area. A famous work has been proposed by uh, the team of uh, David Taylor, Lucas Usmel and co-workers. And uh, in this case, the critical dimension, D0 in my slide here, has the advantage to be correlated or to be linked with the fracture mechanics. I will talk about that in a few in the next slides. Another approach also but that I have not time to discuss in details here. This is the effective distance proposed by uh, Pluvinage. So, if I say that the critical distance with uh, the work proposed by David Taylor and co-workers has the advantage to be very close to fracture mechanics, so there is a clear explanation about the, the value of D0, about this distance. So, this is a notch-like approach. So, in literature, there are some authors discussing is a notch uh, is the defects a notch or not. Nevertheless, this approach has a good advantage because with it we can predict the famous Kitagawa-Takahashi diagram and explain why below a critical area, the critical size of the defects, there is no significant effect on the fatigue strength and for a critical defect size, we can after that explain the decrease of the fatigue strength. So this is very good for engineering application, but Again, the load type effect is not considered. I mean the pure stress gradient effect if we look at the size of the component. The size effect is taken into account for the size of the defect, but not for the component. If we look at the three-dimensional methods, either to compute the mean value over a surface, the mean value of the criterion is computed over a volume. So I sit here, I present some approach where the, the most known is maybe the V90% volume that has been proposed by Sonsino. There are other approach, uh, one approach named Vista proposed by myself and co-workers and more recent approach proposed by uh, Elmi and so on. So the definition of the volume has a three main, uh, there are three main uh, ways to define this volume. I, either you define the volume by a priori a stress level, this is the case for Sonsino approach of E90%, where the threshold is given by the von Mises equivalent stress exceeding 90% of the maximum value over the specimen or over the components. Uh, in the other approach, this star, the threshold volume is limited by a stress that is a characteristic of the material. This is the threshold, this is the threshold below the fatigue limit corresponding to the non-propagating level for short cracks. So the volume is defined by the set of points where short cracks arrested in the material can be present around the notch. And the, other, the last category of uh, three-dimensional methods is defined by uh, a critical distance defining a sphere around the defects, like for the one-dimensional methods. Another way to approach uh, this problem is to compute neither a mean value, but to compute a mathematical definition of the stress gradient. So, the one-dimensional approach of this category of methods is, for instance, using the relative stress gradient that is defined by this equation. If you imagine a line from the notch root to the material center, you can compute a xi, this equation, and weight your high cycle fatigue strength with this in order to explain the highest fatigue strengths due to the gradient. So this is, for instance, the proposal of CETIM. And another approach uh, has been applied by the team of NADO, that is a directive stress gradient, DSJ, that is nothing else than an application of the Poisson criterion, but weighted by the mathematical gradient. So NADO and his colleagues, in order to have a simple engineering uh, approach, uh, do not compute the exact mathematical gradient, but, but they approximate the gradient according to the mean gradient over a distance corresponding to the size of the defects, square root area according to the famous Murakami parameters. And with this approach, it's very efficient to predict the surface 
the effect of surface defects. As soon as the defect is not very big, I mean for defects, for instance, that could be a 2, 3, 4 millimeters in diameter, it doesn't work, but up to approximately 1 millimeter, it gives good results. And the, the other approach, assuming that the mathematical stress gradient can explain the, the stress gradient effect, is proposed, has been proposed by Papadopoulos at the, the end of the last century. So I'm sorry because there is a problem with this equation. Here you should have only uh, the positive part, and here are smaller than B. Uh, so this is a crossland criterion modified by the gradient, the mathematical definition of the hydrostatic stress. So Papadopoulos used the gradient of the, the hydrostatic stress because you know in fatigue that it plays a very important role. And with this approach it's very interesting that uh, without any uh, fitting parameter we are able to predict the famous Goose and Polar parabola for combined bending and torsion. This is the results here, for instance. So you can predict that if you, if you do a test under tension, under torsion and bending and under torsion and tension, you, you have a changement of the ellipse. And this has been recently used and uh, applied also by uh, Liu and Miturnam with different approach, different high cycle fatigue criteria and always he predicts in a good way, experimental data for multi-axial loading. So as a synthesis, what we can say about this mathematical gradient approach, such approach are able, is able to, to explain the load type effect, uh, whatever the combined loadings. It takes into account the effect of notches and the effect of defects at the surface of the material. But the effect of the constitutive equation has to be noted. I mean that uh, if we, you want to obtain good results, you need, of course, to input in your calculation methodology a good elastic, elastoplastic modeling of the behavior of the material because due to notches or due to defects, most of the time, even if, if you are in high cycle fatigue, there is plasticity. Nevertheless, such approach do not predict the pure size effect. So it's necessary to take the pure size effect to combine with the probabilistic approach. And uh, since I have not a lot of time, I'm sorry, there is also another set of, uh, of uh, methodologies, that is the fractal methods proposed by uh, Carpentry, but I have not enough time to detail now. So as a synthesis, we can say that in fact, in literature, there are several approaches based on a non-local mean value or mathematical stress gradient, but there are not, no comparison of all these methods with uh, very significant data. So it should be interesting to do that. However, however the results are good for uh, engineering application, but the definition of the distance, the area or the volume is not very easy and not very well correlated to the microstructure. It's difficult to apply the two-dimensional methods on real components with a very complex shape. Uh, so, to avoid this drawback, you can use three-dimensional methods, but it needs a very fine, finite element analysis to describe the defects. And as I said, it's very important to use a very good constitutive equation in the finite element mod methodology. So now, I will focus on the, maybe the most interesting part of the, the talk. I hope this is the, it will be the most interesting part for you about the competition of the gradient and size effect at different scale, at the grain scale. So as I said in my introduction, you may have, for instance, a competition between a very sharp notch uh, and also with defects at the surface, like here. This is an artificial, an artificial defects. But you may have also real defects, like on this example, that this is the corrosion bit. And you can see that this piece is responsible for the crack initiation that is here, highlighted in red here. And there is a competition between the size of the piece and the grain size. So the question is when a crack can be considered as a notch or when the notch can be considered as a defect and so on. So in fact the notch creates stress at the macroscopic scale and the defects create uh, stress gradient at a lower scale and also below this scale there is a gradient due to the grain orientation and so on. So to try to separate this effect or to take all of them into account, uh, recent results in literature are based on the work done by McDowell, Dune and Prisbilla 
and they have shown with the many simulations that uh, the key mac microstructural parameters are the following. The list is a little bit long, but uh, we can uh, we can focus on the shape and the size of the brain and their crystallographic orientation. The the, uh, sorry, the anisotropic properties of the brain in the elastic regime and the, the critical location of the brain misoriented compared to the loading and also on material with complex microstructure the different behavior of the different phases so several papers in literature uh, have explained have used this approach with finite element analysis and the polycrystalline plasticity with the constitutive equation of the different phase at the grain scale to explain, for instance, or to predict the Kitagawa di diagram. I see it here, for instance, uh, works by Endo or by Sylvie Pomier and co-workers. And uh, also below, below here, uh, sorry, in the bottom of the slide, some works of my French colleagues. So I'm presenting now some interesting results with different size of defects at the surface of the material with the competition between the gradient due to the defects and the gradient due to the microstructure. So I, I will present you the condition of the simulation either in two dimension and in the next slide in three dimension. So to do that, uh, the different colleagues seated here in the reference carried out works with the finite element simulation with polycrystalline plasticity in two dimension here with the surface notch or with a round notch on a specimen loaded in tension. So it has been done on a synthetic polycrystal uh, microstructure with a hypothesis of a plain strain generalized hypothesis. And in three dimension, it's more or less the same assumption, except that the grain are in three dimension. And in this case, the, only the surface defect has been studied up to now, at least in my presentation. So it's also a synthetic polycrystal uh, microstructure and different size of uh, defects have been studied. So if we look, before to show you the results, if we look at the constitutive equation at the grain scale, in all the papers I have found in literature, this is the same uh, uh, polycrystal constitutive equation proposed by Merrick, Cayuto and Gasperini. In this, in this constitutive equation, both the cubic elasticity of the grain is considered and the crystal plasticity or viscoplasticity and the interaction between the different slip systems. I present you here the value of uh, the different parameters identified for copper, but you can find in literature also for different materials like stainless steel uh, 316L, for instance, and others. Several, co several papers have been presented be, uh, during this conference, for instance, by Musterman in, uh, uh, two days ago, I think, or three days ago, with the same type of approach. If we look at the results, so first I show you on this slide the accumulated plastic strain on the microstructure computed in three dimensions with the surface defects on the left without any defects and on the right with uh, defects of uh, 50 micrometers. And you, you have two columns of uh, microstructure with the same shape of grain but different crystal orientation. So the first column is one grain orientation, the other one another one crystallographic orientation. And what you can see, the first line is the tension under fully reverse loading results, the second one is under shear, and the last one, last line is under combined tension and torsion. You can see that there is a big heterogeneity of the accumulated plastic strain when there is no defects and as soon as there is a defect, in this case the defect is big compared to the grain size, of course the defect localizes the plasticity and all the plasticity appears and is accumulated at the defects or around the defects. If we look now at different, with different defects, so this is now the accumulated von Mises equivalent plastic strain simulated after 10 cycles and simulated with different microstructure. The first column on the left is a, with a defect diameter of a zero micrometer without any defects. And you can see that there is a strong heterogeneity of the accumulated plastic strain that are highlighted by... So you can see that the hot spots are in the microstructure. If you put a defect at the surface with different diameter, 80 micrometer up to 200 
40 micrometer, you can see that when the defects increase in diameter, it will concentrate or it will create a localization of the plastic strain and the hot spot within the grain is attracted in fact by the defects at the surface. So it's clear that when the defects is, as, is enough big, bigger than the grain size, it will concentrate the plasticity and so will be responsible of the crack initiation. So this is a result on pure copper. Now I will present, I'm presenting you some uh, results on uh, stainless steel 316L with a probabilistic approach combined with finite element analysis and polycrystal plasticity. So in this simulation, you see here a, a map of the failure probability per grain that has been modeled by a simple equation that is here with a Vibule type equation, assuming that uh, for creating plasticity, we assume that the shear stress amplitude on each sleep system has to be higher than the threshold. And this threshold, T, T stress, TA threshold, is distributed uh, according to the Vibule distribution that is illustrated here on the left. Sorry. And depending on the M exponent of the Vibule distribution, as I explained to you, the M exponent is uh, responsible of the scatter of the distribution. When M is a small, you have a large scatter, and with, when M is small, you have a very narrow distribution. So you can see here that when there is no defect, you have a, an heterogene very heterogeneous distribution of the failure of the, pro of the probability of failure per grain. As soon as there is a defect, there is a, of course a localization, and the probability of failure increases significantly. And what is interesting also is that depending on the M value, you change the map. You can see if M is high, you change significantly the probability of failure. The same result is possible to obtain under torsion or tension and torsion, but I have not enough time to show you here. And since the M parameter of the Vebule distribution is responsible of the scatter, if you plot the fatigue limit versus the diameter of the defects for different uh, type of loading, here under tension, torsion, or combined tension and torsion in phase, for different diameter of defects. So different diameter of the defects. You can see that if you, if you change the value of the M exponent, you can find exactly experimental results and explain a Kitagawa-Takahashi diagram with a probabilistic approach considering also the local competition between the gradient due to the notch and the gradient due to the grain uh, orientation and the microstructure. So as a synthesis of this approach, what we can say is that uh, the degree of heterogeneity of uh, slips in the microstructure is very important in high cycle fatigue and with this type of methodology you can take into account an, in an explicit way the, the microstructure effect on the high cycle fatigue strengths and you can take into account the effect of uh, microtexture, defects and multi-axiality. There are several prospects, of course, take into account the macrotexture, the mean stress effect, the effect of the orientation of the grain and the orientation, for instance, of the texture, the gradient of the microstructure and the properties of the microstructure, for instance, if you have a material that is length, uh, rolled and so on. And for multi-phase material, it's also much more difficult, but uh, for instance, Mr. Mann has presented uh, in the past days of this conference an interesting paper about that. As conclusion, what I would like to emphasize is that uh, I hope I have shown you that there is a big competition between uh, at least a three scale and may maybe four. The biggest one is the gradient due to the macroscopic loading. There is also the gradient due to the notch, and if you introduce the defects, there is a competition between the gradient induced by the defects and also the gradient at the grain scale without any defects. So the stress gradient effect, as I defined as pure gradient effect, is due to mainly the, the loading, the notch, I mean the geometry, the material defects, and the microstructure. Of course, an important point that I didn't talk up to now is the residual stress. And in reality, of course, residual stresses is not homogeneous. There, are, there is a gradient, and also it's a multi-axial stress field, so it's necessary to take into account 
but there are not a lot of works about that. I think it's very important for future work. And the size effect is explained by material defects. Uh, we have to, to remind that uh, mean value approach and mathematical stress gradient give good results for engineering application, uh, for taking into account the stress gradient. And the pure size effect is usually taken into account by a Weibull approach or a probabilistic approach. In order to go to a lower scale, the most efficient tools is to combine finite element analysis and uh, polycrystal plasticity. And as prospects, I think that a key point to progress for the size effect understanding is uh, to find a way uh, of a new assumption than the weakest link concept. Because, for instance, if you decrease the fatigue life, if you go in low cycle fatigue, the assumption of independence of the links or of the brain of the material is not correct anymore because uh, of the plasticity. And up to now, I think this is an open question. Uh, I think also an important work for future is to try to under understand the effect of interaction between defects at the surface, for instance, and uh, brain orientations and so on. So I think uh, many studies are interesting to, to run to understand that. Uh, with, for instance, the use of uh, the presented uh, approach with polycrystal plasticity. Thank you for your attention.